you all for being here tonight and for braving the cold that has uh, invaded Florida from the north. <laughs> okay, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, those big words that you see here. Uh, you can see related to physical aspects of the oceans, but we're going to see how those physical uh, aspects of the oceans are really important for uh, life and marine life. Uh, uh, in general, and for some of the uh, for reef fish species that we're going to talk about. And uh, why? Because we all care about two things on this planet. It's reproduction and survival. Survival means finding food and a shelter, or a place to live. A place that's going to give you food, but also to maintain our population, we have to reproduce. Okay. And so any organisms on this planet has to do that. And fish in the environment, they have to find the right location to do that. Why? Because the environment is the one that takes care and basically control their survivorship. That's the one that's going to bring them their food. That's the one that's going to give them shelter. And the journey that they have to go through, in particular the larvae, the fish larvae, can be really full of dangers and obstacles. I don't know if you remember Nemo, but it's more or less like that, even worse in some places. Um, so I'm showing you here one of the most exciting experiments I've conducted, which is uh, monitoring one of those locations where uh, fish, reef fish species, and in particular you can recognize them here, uh, groupers gather to spawn. And they gather in large numbers, which means that for this area in particular in the, the southern shelf of the U.S. Virgin Islands, it's all the fish from the entire regions of the Virgin Islands, including Puerto Rico, the U.S., and the British Virgin Islands, and maybe some St. Croix, Croix, which is south of St. Thomas. So you have the entire population of that northern corner of the Caribbean that gets together at one specific location and one specific time of the year to do one thing to spawn, right? And as you can see here, you have a NASA grouper come around. They are very curious, so very easy to catch. And then you also have other type of groupers uh, here, which are called yellowfin groupers. All those groupers are between 20 and 40 pounds, even a bigger for some. So really, they are mature adults with younger adults that follow them to learn the path and the travel, the journey to that aggregation for wherever, from wherever they're coming from. So it's a, there's a lot going on at those aggregations. And you can imagine when fishermen found a place like that, here you had about 8,000, 10,000 fish in the water. When you found, and when they found a place like that, it was so predictable so that it was so easy to target every year at the same time, same location, and you can catch an infinite number of fish to the aggregation dispersed, which means that each fish went back to its home. And it lasts for between two and three months. So imagine the availability, the amount of fish that's available, and how easy it is to target them, and how easy it is to deplete the stock completely. Because as you know, you know we used to have the same type of aggregation in Miami, in the Florida Keys, uh, and all the places around the Caribbean that have actually disappeared. There used to be a gag group of aggregation just off West Palm. The only trace of the aggregation they could find were the dead fish at the, at the fish market the next day, and scientists could never find a fish in the water, actually. So since the, the closure, the fishing uh, closure during spawning season in Florida, we've seen a comeback of those aggregations from the few adults that were left. And for instance, in the Virgin Islands, you see on this image like, some of the groupers are NASA groupers mixed with the rest of the yellowfin groupers. Why? Because they're not in big enough number to get together from their own aggregation and spawn. It's to tell you how like, uh, weak they are in terms of sustaining their population right now because they've been overfished. So what we try to understand here is what brings them there. Why did they choose their, that location? And we're going to throw, go through the ideas that have been uh, brought forward to try to understand what's specific to this area that will bring fish and have them travel hundreds of kilometers to go there and spawn. You have to be really motivated to go there. 
So let's uh, go over the life cycle of a little baby grouper in the ocean. And for the setting of that uh, life cycle, we're going to use Florida because we know that place very well. Uh, so let's think about the Everglades. Uh, and then as we cross over to the ocean, we're going to go through the grass beds. You know, that's where you go fish those snooks and those redfish. Then you're going to go snorkeling on the reef uh, after crossing the islands. And then you get to the reef and then further out you get into the Florida current, which is this very swift current that transports a lot of materials. And we call it, I think, uh, which is also a very productive area, so where the fishing is really good. But why is it good? You know, we don't really know as well. So what happens? Fish, let's say the example of the Gorai grouper, gather at the edge of the shelf where the current, you know, could be strong, but also could do some interesting things that we're going to see uh, in, uh, in the following uh, slides. They gather and uh, they're going to release their eggs in the ocean. Those eggs will be transported by the currents in a location where when the, the larvae hatch, they're going to have food, right? So remember, Habitat, food, that's what matters for us. And then, by some miracle, as they grow, they're going to be transported one day all the way back to their nursery habitat, which is basically the Everglades, Florida Bay, uh, Flamingo, and the backcountry, where you're going to go find and fish using a live, fish, a live uh, pinfish, juvenile coli groupers. And then as they grow, they're going to go back to actually where the adult... Uh, range is, which is near the reef and where they spawn again. And so like that, we just went through their life uh, cycle closure, okay? So now if we think about all those different steps, animals and marine organisms and baby groupers have to go through, uh, how does it fit together? First, we have a fish population that every year has this need to reproduce. So they're going to migrate to the spawning habitat. And then from that spawning habitat, those baby fish, and because of, because of the movement of water, because of the intricacies of transport in the ocean, and then because of the presence of good habitat on their path to their nursery ground, they're going to be able to complete this life cycle. And as you see here, the most important bubble in this diagram is the spawning habitat. Because if you don't have a spawning habitat, the rest doesn't exist. right? because you won't have the right level of transport that will take you to the, a good habitat where you're going to find a good nursery that will help you to grow and to replenish the fish population. So we're going to focus on the reason why this uh, spawning habitat is important and what is it made of. So at the end of the day, what constrains the choice of the spawning habitat? It's the success of early life development. So if you don't make it through that stage by, with the maximum chances on your side, most likely you never make it to the adult stage. So that's the first stage you have to overcome to be able to become an adult, right? It makes sense. And so as you see, all the fish species have basically evolved to find an environment that's going to constitute this spawning habitat so that it is favorable for their larval development. So that's what matters the, the, most, the most. So now we're going to try to see what this larval, suitable uh, larval environment is made of. And one of the scientists at the University of Miami, Andy Bacon, came up with this hypothesis of the uh, ocean triads. And we're going to see what the ocean triads means and is uh, for those spawning habitats. He stated, basically, after observing many, many uh, ecosystems around uh, the oceans, that uh, a good reproductive area actually um, is able to enhance or to create enrichment, which means bringing food, making food available to the, the hatchling uh, larvae. So I take the example of the upwelling system on the west coast of continents in general, where you have this uh, uh, upward lifting of nutrient into the ophotic layer, so basically the layer where the, the light can penetrate that creates those planktonic bloom and that attracts uh, feeders like bait fish and then predators, predators that eat the bait fish. So you need to have enrichment, you need to have concentration. So I'll show you here an image 
uh, in our region of all the fronts. Fronts are basically convergence zones that accumulate the detritus, but also uh, life. Uh, you know, larvae, algae, uh, and all the, the food chain that comes with it. And so that's a, a snapshot of, of uh, one day around the globe near, near Earth of all the different convergence areas that are available for fish uh, to gather or that bring a fish and their food together. Another type of uh, concentration area in the ocean is now, if you look vertically, through the water column, so you have uh, depth here, and these are different profiles that were measured with uh, an instrument that measured chlorophyll. You see those little artifacts here that are actually peaks of high chlorophyll concentration in layers stacked together in the ocean in specific places of the shelf of the island of St. Thomas, just south of where we, I show you that movie of the aggregation. So you can see also that in Within the ocean, you also have those areas, those layers, we call them those patches that concentrate uh, uh, food, larvae, and other organisms. The third characteristic of a good spawning habitat is the possibility for uh, retention and delivery. Retention means we're going to keep uh, everybody together, right? Won't be dispersed. So I'll take the example of the sargassum patch. And then we're going to move everybody together, uh, you know, nearby. Or we're going to bring everybody together uh, to shore. So you can imagine, for instance, how, I don't know if you've seen uh, what lives under or within a sargassum patch, but it's a, it's a full ecosystem of baby fish and big fish that feed from under. And sometimes this entire mat drifts all the way to the beach. Okay, so you have retention that, and then keeps the animal together, concentrated, and send them to the beach. And delivery, uh, the other type of mechanism in the ocean that ensure delivery of these concentrated particles. So I'm showing you here uh, the result from an experiment. This is time, so days of the uh, month of the year, and that's the number of families in larval traps that were deployed in the Florida Keys. So larval traps, it's a little box with a light that you deploy at night and attracts the, the fish larvae, okay? And the next morning you, call, you come, you recover it and count the larvae in it and identify the species. And you see like you have peaks here, those big uh, sticks here that, you, uh, that are associated with the uh, new moon, so no lights during this time period. And if you look at the environment now, which means in particular the currents around this area when the peaks occurred, you realize that they were associated with the passage of uh, small eddies, so recirculating features. And uh, those eddies were associated with the pulse of delivery of larvae to the reef. And those eddies, you know that they sit at the front between the Florida current and uh, the, the, the shelf, basically, the, reef, the reefs. So that's the mechanism for also retention because, as, because of the circular circulations, material can be trapped inside, but as it interacts with the reef, it can also release some of the larvae it was uh, carrying with him and uh, bring them back to the reef where they may make their way back to their nursery ground. Therefore, there is a correlation between the spatial and the temporal occurrence of those three constraints and the availability of a spawning habitat. So at the spawning habitat, what we realize is it will be defined by the presence and the existence of those three characteristics, which is retention, concentration, and enrichment. Okay? And the other thing is, when you look at the spawning habitat and you think about the, rep that the fact that uh, fish go back every year, at a very specific time, and it's always at the same time, and it's particularly uh, locked with a certain phase of the moon, they, there's really a site fidelity and also a time fidelity to going back to that system, which means that all those three features that define a spawning habitat must be somehow resilient against changes at that specific location. Otherwise, 
you would go back there and if what you expect to see is not there anymore, it's no more spawning habitat. And you know that those fish has been coming back over and over for millions of years to that specific location, which means that those three features are permanent features that are always there, uh, the spawning habitat. So, um, the conclusion here is that the special and temporal occurrence of all three features must be of robust against interannual environmental viability. So this is something we're trying to understand. And what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna show you that those three features, I'm gonna take some examples, two examples, and show you that those three features actually exist at, at spawning habitats that we know and are actually uh, resilient features to changes because of the way they are created. And um, before we do that, we're gonna look at three common strategies for um, spawning. Um, basically, what are the expected journeys of fish larvae in the ocean and how you know, fish are adapted to three strategies in particular. The first one is the local retention and self-recruitment near uh, the parental habitat and population. So basically, fish that spawn near the island have their larvae recruit near the island. Okay, they don't, uh, the goal is not to disperse them further away from the island, okay? So that's one example. The second one is dispersal toward distant settlement locations. That's the case, for instance, for lobster larvae. As you see here, the lines show you the connection between larvae release in Honduras, on Honduras Bank, and other reefs around the Caribbean. And you see a lot of those connections go to the Bahamas, but also the Florida Keys and the uh, uh, Leeward Antilles, okay? What that tell you is like now, if you wanna say, okay, I wanna protect my lobster, I wanna have a lobster season, or I wanna uh, manage my lobster stocks, you have to account for who are your suppliers. And actually, if you look at the Florida Keys, we realize a lot of the suppliers of the Florida uh, Key stocks are actually not in the Florida Keys. So if you want to manage your resource there, then you have to ask the, the origin population to actually manage their stocks. So the, the country where those populations are coming from to manage their stock. Hours. So you, have, you need collaboration between countries to be able to do a good management if the dispersal strategy is something like that. The other strategy, the third one, is a combination of the past two, where the dispersal is from and back to the natal side, but they go away from a while and, and, and wander in the environment, explore the world, just like you know, uh, teenagers before they go back to their, their parental habitat. And so I'll show you here a simulation. So basically we use mathematical models to predict the transport of, of those eggs, and we show here uh, how uh, eggs release in Glover's Atoll in Belize were able to come back to the atoll. Okay, so they circled away, they meandered away, but finally made it back to the atoll. So you have two examples here. Some decided to go for a long journey and never made it back, okay? So what I'm gonna show you here now is uh, we're gonna look at spawning habitat and we're gonna to try to identify the ocean triad hypothesis that uh, uh, Andy Bakun put together and try to verify that actually those features actually exist in spawning habitat, like the one I showed you the movie for. And we're gonna see another thing is that those spawning habitat uh, sit in very specific type of environment that will ensure resiliency and consistency of the flow through changing times. And, um, and then we're gonna have some discussion and conclusions on some of the features that actually really control that consistency and resistance to time. So to do that, these are the two cases. As I said earlier, I'm gonna show you uh, an example in the Mesoamerican region, so near Belize, and an example in the Caribbean, and we're gonna look at the island of St. Croix. Saint Croix. I mean, the more I get tired, the, 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 the stronger I get my French accent. I'm sorry. But, uh, I'm going to have to go to bed soon, otherwise I'm going to stop. End up speaking French to you. Uh, spawning habitat 
in these different regions. So let's start with the Mesoamerican Reef. So I guess you recognize uh, that image here. Um, so you can see Belize is located here. Here you have Mexico, uh, Guatemala, and Honduras on this side. And then the spawning locations are located mostly in the southern part of this region. And here they are, the most famous ones that probably some of you dove. And uh, they are mostly located around promontories, uh, island uh, points, and uh, submerged caves. And they're mostly south of 19 degree north and we're gonna see what this uh, location is important. What do they look like uh, underwater? It's, it's just like a cave, okay? So, uh, you know, usually you have a lighthouse uh, on a cave. You can see the cave from land. So the same thing, the extension in the water, which looks like that. And that's the, basically the selected place for those fish to spawn. So that's the spawning habitat. But what characterizes the spawning habitat um, in the Virgin Islands, so, so you recognize the Caribbean Sea, St. Croix is here. It's slightly isolated from the other islands. Here is a closer view and some uh, surveys that we've done to look at uh, connectivity between the islands. So to see if, uh, you know, collect sample of uh, fish larvae in that region. And here we could genetically match them or not, you know, see some connection between there's a shared parenthood or other or complete separation between the different populations. And then I want you to take a look at this map that shows uh, the extension of the shelf of St. Croix on the, uh, the surface of the ocean where the two uh, major spawning irrigation sites are shown. So here at the mutton snapper spawning irrigation and here it's also red hind and mutton snapper spawning irrigation. And I want you to memorize these locations because you're gonna see that they're not uh, where they are by uh, coincidence. All right, so now let's, we saw what, what they look like in the water. Now let's see what the environment is in particular their current environment. Back to the Mesoamerican region, so I don't know if you know the circulation in the Caribbean Sea, you have basically the Caribbean current that flows from east to uh, west and then end up turning north uh, right in front of Mexico here where it becomes, uh, when it crosses the Yucatan Channel here, the Florida current, right? the loop current, sorry, in the Gulf of Mexico. And here the current gets pretty strong just like the Florida current in the Strait of Florida but through the season, this location here, basically where the Caribbean current makes its turn, varies, moves, uh, I would say, up and down, north and south. And this variation, this uh, latitudinal variations, controls the presence of a south, southward flow here that creates this recirculation gyre, which is called the Honduras gyre. And this flow is very interesting because it's seasonal, but and it flows by all the different capes and spawning sites that I showed you earlier, just south of 19 North. Okay, so this region here doesn't get impacted directly by the Caribbean current, the, the swift Caribbean current here, but rather by a branch that recirculates now uh, south, which is not as strong in terms of current, but as you can see here, deviates a lot as it goes to that region here, and that's very important. But what we see here is that there's this consistent, there's consistency in the presence of that flow due to the presence of that one, okay? So the large scale circulation drives at a smaller scale the situation to uh, all the features south of the big flow here. Now, back to the Caribbean, what do we have here? Sedum, sedum, it's called dissolve organic matter. Uh, absorption coefficient. So basically, um, you know, now uh, NASA and other European agencies have invested a lot in what we call ocean color. And by looking at the ocean through different colored lengths actually, and by recombining the, the signal, the received signal through those lengths, you can estimate the presence of chlorophyll, of this, uh, partic this, this uh, organic matter in uh, in the ocean and, and other parameters. And basically that tells you where 
the plume from the Amazon and Oyoko rivers, where it's coming from and how it is entrained in the Caribbean. That's a yearly uh, time series, a month, that's a monthly mean, so you see through the year an increase, it's particular in July, of the amount of chlorophyll, of sedum, sorry, coming into the Caribbean, driven by uh, the uh, North Brazil current and the North Brazil current rings, one of them big, large eddies that impact the Caribbean, uh, go through all the, the channels between the island and the Caribbean here, and creates basically a new circulation in that region associated to the presence of fresh water brought by uh, that, big, that big plume here. And this uh, freshwater impact that I have studied actually uh, controls the circulation around the island of St. Croix. So again, you have a, you know, a quarter of the earth system, circulation system that comes in into a region that will specifically impact that region a certain way, okay? And that, the fact that the system belongs to a global circulation system, uh, some sort of uh, warranties that the consistency of the flow through time and through the years, because that's what I showed you earlier and what you see here happens every year and has been happening every year for millions of years uh, the same way. Okay. Uh, so now let's look at those specific locations now that we know uh, the surroundings and see if we can recover through the interaction with uh, the bottom uh, of the ocean, so those capes and the, the, the coast of the island, uh, the shelf of the island and the water, see if we can recover those uh, characteristics of uh, spawning habitat that uh, which are uh, the ocean triads. To do that, now let's get a little bit more into the science and the mathematics. So basically we've used, uh, what you're gonna see uh, after that, we've used numerical models. So we've simulated the flow just like a weather model, but for the ocean to understand the circulation around those capes. So in the Mesoamerican region, if you look at the distribution of capes along the coast, you realize that you have a lot of capes that look like the spawning capes, but where fish are not spawning. And the question is, why is that? Okay, so we call those capes control capes. And uh, we're gonna compare them in terms of dynamics, so how they create those features that will constitute the ocean trails in the ocean and see why a spawning cape is a spawning cape and not the other capes. And so to do that, we've come up with a classification following, you know, using those numbers here, but um, you don't need to know what they are exactly. Now, in the Virgin Islands, we did the same thing. I simulated the circulation in northeastern Caribbean using an ocean model, so just like an atmospheric model that gives me flow patterns. And I show you here snapshots of the model compared to snapshots of observations. Those observations here, it's a radar, HF radar footprint uh, of the ocean currents at the surface, how this, uh, this radar works. Basically, it shoots a radio wave outside uh, to the ocean that bounces uh, on the waves, okay? And by theory, we know the speed of those waves. So if the speed that we estimate is faster than the speed of the wave, the theoretical th speed of the waves, then the difference tells you the speed of the current. So that's how we know the current here. So what I'm showing you here is that the model is able to reproduce the observed patterns. And I'm going to give you, so you say, okay, but that's maybe just random. You just got lucky that day. Well, not because it happened again. Okay, another time where I was able to show that the circulation north of the island was actually simulated by the model. And you say, well, but, you know, you can have twice the chance. No, it happened again. Okay, so I can prove like that my model is doing a good thing. So I can use that to understand what's happening in the water and in, in the ocean. All right, now back to the um, uh, Mesoamerican Reef, and now we're gonna go through the verification of the ocean triad uh, theory, basically. So the first thing we wanna see if the features created when the current go over those uh, promontories uh, create enrichment. 
So these are the features if you look from the top, okay, so an aerial view, you see my eddies here, and then I have made cross sections across those eddies here, like this one, so from the surface to the bottom, that you see here that shows the density, and density is usually uh, varies with vertical movements in the water. And what you see here is like extreme variations, okay, that bring up some deep densities to the surface, like this one here or this one here, that tells me that there's upwelling, just like a wind-driven upwelling on the west coast, in that region below the eddies that is concentrated in certain areas of the eddies, and so which means that there is enrichment, right? In, uh, in the, the case of the Caribbean island, so this is the distribution of the circulation around the island due to the impingement of this incident flow here coming from the south due to the uh, penetration of the fresh water from the Amazon and Orinoco into the Caribbean, where you see the formation of wake eddies on the leeward side of the island, on the wake side of the island, okay? Now, if I look at the structure of those eddies, so basically I go in the water and I measure as earlier this time, uh, the density as well, these are the black lines here. What do you see through the eddies? There's vertical pumping. Those uh, uh, iso lines here are pushed to the surface, which means that there's upwelling too. Okay, so in both sides, we have a wetting, we have enrichment. Now, what about concentration and retention? So uh, my student at the time, uh, release particle in, um, in the model and look at the distribution and the, the effect of concentration and retention of those eddies on those particles. As you find, uh, if you look at this diagram here that shows you the index of aggregation versus uh, days after the formation of the eddy, you see that this index is much bigger for eddies form at a spawning cave than uh, eddies for not format spawning cape, which means that spawning cape eddies actually enhance concentration. Now, in regards to retention, if you look at this graph here, the average distance from shore, you realize that eddies form at uh, spawning cape have a tendency to keep uh, the particles close to shore, so it doesn't, they don't carry them far away from shore, so they have a chance if larvae are trapping it to make it back. Okay, so we see that eddies form at capes, at spawning capes, are more likely to favor concentrations and retention. Now let's go back to the Caribbean land, and we did the same thing uh, in the wakes that we saw, okay? We release particles, and uh, what do we find? This is a diagram that shows you the distance covered by particles when we, they were released in the, in the wake, okay? And that's the number of particles in there, okay? So you see, it's, it's, we call this a bimodal a distribution because you have two peaks, one here and another one here. What, this one is very close, which tells you retention, okay? So retention near the island, this one is further away, about 150 kilometers away, but you see they're all together. So you have concentration. All right. So now let's uh, look at retention in particular. You, we see that actually the, that shows you the larvae retained near the different reefs around the island and you see that you have a gradient between those reefs, okay, in particular here, so very high on the leeward reefs and low on the windward reef, and then that varies through years, but there's some consistency through the distribution, and that also tells us that the larvae release near the island actually stayed on the island. So we have a mechanism of retention uh, near the island as well. So what can we say now about those findings? We tried to pull together um, some parameters to sort of differentiate the capes between each other. And we didn't come up with anything strong enough to say, oh, that's, that's why, that's how they are different. The only thing we came up with is 
that was very different between the caves because of this low parameter here is this variable here, which is called potential vorticity. So what's potential vorticity? Potential vorticity is the ability to spin on yourself. It's your ballerina, your ice skater that spins, spreads her arm. You know how she goes uh, slowly when she, she spreads her arm and goes really fast when she closes them? That, that feature, that uh, capacity is called, uh, has a name, it's called, uh, we could call it velocity, but it's angular momentum and that quantity is conserved, okay? So as you decrease your radius, you're gonna spin faster. If you're increasing, you spin slower. The same thing exactly uh, happens in the ocean. And the other thing interesting about that, it's like, it's, we all have a little bit of that because the earth is rotating and that um, rotation energy that we have is present in the ocean and in the, and, and in the air as well. For instance, if you would throw a stone, uh, in the northern hemisphere, parallel to, you know, across a, a latitude uh, line, your stone wouldn't go straight, but it would start deflecting to the right, okay, because of the rotation, rotation of the Earth. And that's a Coriolis effect. So that rotation is in any particle of air or of water in the ocean and creates and make particles rotate. And so we can emphasize that effect, and that effect can be emphasized when the flow interacts with the topography, and in that case, with the capes. All right, so what's, at the end of the day, the difference between the capes is how much vorticity they are able to generate on the flow. And then that vorticity control the eddies and then control the fact that the eddies are able to create enrichment, retention, and uh, concentration. So uh, the way to call that uh, topographic effect on uh, the formation of the eddies is uh, by using that word, the form drag. It's basically how much drag you have to create on the current to be able to create those eddies, okay? So drag plays a significant role in the creation of movement in the oceans when a current interacts with the topography. So if you have a larger drag, you're gonna create most likely more vorticity and this is going to affect uh, how good or bad the triad is going to be in that eddy. Okay, so you see how everything is related. Okay, you have this big current that comes that hits the island that creates an eddy, but the way it's going to hit the island and how much drag is going to be uh, induced into that current will affect the way the ocean triad is created and then affect the survivorship of the larvae. So I'm gonna show you here uh, actually how it happens. So that's the, I show you this image earlier. You see south of St. Croix here, you have this little promontory. Remember that promontory? I'm sure you remember because that's where we have a spring irrigation of mutton snappers. And so when the current is straightly from the, the south, they hit the edge of the promontory and doesn't really go over the promontory here. And you have a little bit of uh, recirculation on this side of the island. Now imagine the current shifts to the southeast, and so it's gonna be brought to go over that um, a promontory and then to feel some drag, and so what happens? Okay, so that's the case, and you see right here, this development of vorticity, okay? And so what does the circulation look at the surface? Now you have this big eddy. All right, compared to the one earlier. And so now if you, we would release particles in that case, that would be our new distribution. So we've, by changing the angle of incidence, by increasing the drag on the flow, and that create a larger eddy, we've decreased the local retention and increased the local export, but keep the concentration effect uh, real because it's an eddy. Okay, so what we've come to realize here is that those spawning sites are in places where actually the, the topography controls the flow and the aftermath of the flow when it passes uh, those uh, topographic features. And um, then, which controls the retention and the concentration effects. 
So in some cases, this effect will be emphasized. On other cases, this effect will be reduced. But this effect is still going to be present. And remember how important the fact that uh, those ocean triads features characteristic should be resilient and consistent through time. That's the reason why it's possible. Because the interaction will always create an eddy. And this eddy, even if the strength varies and what it can do to retention and concentration varies, it will still create retention and concentration. And what controls the flow is the foam drag. And the, the foam drag controls the flow both in the Mesoamerican case eddies and in the uh, Caribbean case eddies. Conclusions. Marine organisms then, two different locations, okay, have the same reproduction goal, but they have adapted to different environments. Okay? So one, this is the cave specific where uh, the ocean triad is maximized, which uh, consequently ensure that you know, a lot of the larvae will make it to the end of the journey. Okay? And what control uh, basically the strength of this uh, ocean triads uh, system is how the current interact with the topography. So this really shows the subtle role of topographic effects in flow perturbations, in particular the form of drag, so how much drag projects energy into the system. Uh, this drag increases the strength and coherency of the eddies, which controls the Lagrangian properties, basically the transport characteristics of the flow, and therefore uh, the ocean triad interplay, so the strength of the retention uh, the concentration and uh, the enrichment. And we also saw that because of this uh, large scale circulation and its interaction with the topography that doesn't move, that creates consistent seasonal viability because of consistent large scale flow viability. So the large scale flow is too, always going to be the same, and so the effect is always going to be the same with some viability. Therefore, there's resiliency in. The system, which means that spawning habitat are resilient to, you know, uh, some degree of variations in uh, the, the large-scale circulation in, in, in the natural system. But with the coming uh, changes that we see happening now around the globe, uh, the question is whether those habitats will be strong enough to remain spawning habitats uh, in the face of significant changes in the circulation in the weather, in many things around the globe. And um, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators here and also my sponsors uh, for this work, which is uh, ongoing, actually. And I thank you for your attention.